If you need to promote your band or business or just want to stylize, personalize, or customize your ride, check out vid-decals.com. Want to create and customize your own stickers representing your band or make your own bumper sticker? Vid Decals can do it. All stickers are printed on quality vinyl and can be placed on any flat surface. Stickers are an affordable way to promote your band or business. Go to vid-decals.com to get started. That's vid-decals.com. Vid-decals.com. Rockstarleatherworks.com is your home for badass rock and roll gear. Featuring 100% handmade leather bands, watches, cuffs, bracelets, and more, Rockstar Leatherworks has something for everybody. Whether you are going to the show or you are in it, you can find something to fit your needs. Choose from a variety of designs or create your own masterpiece. Their bands and watches are second to none. They also ship internationally. Who needs a stage to be a rock star? Check out rockstarleatherworks.com. Hi, this is Bobby Brown, and welcome to another fucking podcast. You kids with your loud music and your Dan Fogelberg, your Zima, hula hoops, and Pac-Man video games, don't you see people today have attention spans that can only be measured in nanoseconds? See, son, all legends never die. They just lose weight. Like a legend and an out of bum with a lot of light. <laughs> Party time. Yes, Courtney, it is party time. Hello, Hollywood. Hello, world, and hello, my loyal minions. It is good to see you, and it's always good to be seen. My name is Izzy Presley, and welcome to another fucking podcast. A little uh, special Wednesday afternoon edition in studio. I've got bass icon, two-time Grammy winner, Jerry Gemot. Hello. How you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic, Easy. It's good to see you. Again. Again, yes, again. <laughs> it's been a couple weeks, but, you know, since Soundcheck Live, but, you know, it's it's good. I'm excited for this. I'm excited to hear your story. It's quite a long story, but we're going to make it, we're going to give you the edited version. That we That's can all right. We're going to give you the special FN podcast version. I, I have a feeling that... If we had the time, this would be like the Billy Vera three-hour episode, because Billy can talk like there's no fucking tomorrow. Um, but anyways, um, we'll, we'll get to, we'll get to Jerry in a second here. I just want to get through a little logistics. Um, so basically, yes, it's another effing podcast. Uh, hit me up on the Twitter machine. I'm on my quest for one million followers. I'm currently at about eight hundred. Or, I'm sorry, 1,800, 1,800, 1,800. I'm getting there, though. It's slowly creeping up. I'm getting there. Uh, hit up the social media on uh, Facebook. It's facebook.com slash another effing podcast. And, of course, my personal page, which is Izzy Presley One. Find out everything I'm doing entertainment-wise. If I'm actually going to do stand-up comedy again, you'll find out there. Uh, like next week, for instance, I'm going to be in Vegas Monday night doing Brent Muscat's show. That's going to be fun. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I got a lot of cool stuff coming up. Uh, of course, Soundcheck Live tonight, yeah. which I am lucky enough to host each and every week. Uh, we have members of Chris Cornell's band coming down, and they're doing like a Cornell tribute for the second set, which is going to be awesome. Uh, can't wait for that. And, of course, a regular cast of Minions and amazing amazing players which jerry has joined us many times on that stage and it's been absolutely amazing was, uh, when I, that's how i got to know him and realized i gotta have him on the show because i gotta hear his story um if you want to support the show monetarily you absolutely can you don't have to i tell you this each and every week if you want to support you can i will never charge you for this show but you can send me money because it's not free to do this stuff especially this time of year when everybody has some Loose change, they say. Right. That loose <laughs> change. Uh, the PayPal is izzy.presley at gmail.com. I'm checking, I'm trying out some new uh, equipment here this week, too. All These right. mics, uh, well, I've used this mic already, but second mic, I've got a third mic ho- hooked up. We got uh, Karuna back here. She's going to be taking some pictures. She might <laughs> pop in and say, uh, Oh, hold on, hold on. I had to unmute you. You have to get up on that mic. All right. All right. See, there you go. Hi, Karuna. Hi, world. <laughs> All right. And uh, what else did I have to say? Uh, oh, yeah. The sponsors of the show. Please support the sponsors. Of course, Rockstar Leatherworks and v- Vid Decals. Um, but but there's Sass Pants Designs. Karuna, you might want You might be enjoying this. Ooh, um, she takes like rock shirts and customizes them 
and makes them into like tube top dresses and tank tops and all these really cool, well fitting stuff. And it's absolutely amazing. Sass pants designs. Um, she's actually done a jacket for me too. She's, she's very, very talented. Check that out on Facebook. Beater amplification. I am lucky enough to be sponsored by uh, this great amp company out of Mankato, Minnesota. Um, Hand wired, wonderful amps. It, Look, the way they make these amps, you don't need a fucking overdrive pedal in front of this thing. Hmm. It just, it, he's like, yeah, that's how we designed it. Uh, it's, they're 100 watts, but you can pull two of the tubes and you got a 50 watt. It's Ooh. awesome. Ooh. It's great. And they just sound absolutely killer. So check out Beater Amplification. Uh, Rockstar Leatherworks, I told you about. Rockwood Saloon. Uh, customized pants. He made me this killer, killer leather vest. Check out the Rockwood Saloon and, of course, A&P Productions Laser Engraving Division. They're going to be sending me a bunch of stuff, um, shot glasses, all this stuff. So we'll be able to buy this stuff. As listeners of this show, you can buy shot glasses and say another effing podcast on it. All that kind of cool stuff. I mean, why not? You got to have premiums, man. We can get drunk off your podcast. Yes, we can. And, you know, I do do a show every once in a while called The Drunken Summit. We all get... <laughs> Like three or four people in here, we'll just get hammered and talk shit for like two hours. It's awesome. Like now? Well, not right now. I mean, it's it's noon. It's noon. I, I mean, I have a bottle of Jack Daniels right there, oh, which man. is old number seven. Old number seven. Yeah, baby. Come on, man. Let's hit it. <laughs> Don't tempt me. Don't tempt me, because at twelve ten noon on the. That's not enough for us. No, it's we'll not. We'll pass on that. Yeah, we'll, we'll pass on that. So, Jerry Gemot, uh, dude, I'm very excited about this. Um, so, you you were born in the Bronx in what 46? 40, 46. 46. Yeah, so, man. you're 70 years old right now. Just hit it, man. Um, and a half. How how far back does your musical memory go? You know, actually, that's a really good question. Um, it goes back to 1800s, basically. My mother was born in 1904, so okay. she heard music from the 1800s, and the music that she carried with her, you know, came through me. And you know, this this happens that way for like not only myself, but I think most people. Mm -hmm. You go back about 30 or 40 years, normally. And since my mother was so much older, she was, I'm fortunate to be here because she was like 40 when she had me. Oh, wow. You know, so this is, I was taking a chance back then. Right. Um, so usually people go back usually 20, 30 years, but mm -hmm. she had a longer history. So um, I've really been blessed um, to have that kind of um, lineage in back of me um, subliminally a lot. A lot of things she would sing to me, I hear now, and they're coming from the 20s and 30s, that music, but it's, she would sing these songs to me. And I ask people about these songs, nobody even knows them. <laughs> you know? Right. But I remember the melody. I said, uh -huh. what's the name of this song? And they say, that yeah, sounds familiar. And it sounded like war songs coming out of the First World War, Second World War. So, you know, it's cool. Um, but it's having to um, have that and then play with musicians who were that old at the same time was, right. was a great benefit to me. Because oh, wow. the guys I played with were like 20, 30 years older than me. The first band I played in, I was the bass player. The first professional band, mm -hmm. I was twelve. Oh wow! And I was playing at the boys' club with some kids, and some men heard me playing, and they asked me to, you know, they spoke to me in the hallway, and they asked me to join their band. <laughs> the band leader was sixty, the horn player was forty-five, mm -hmm. and those were the ones who approached me. And then I met the drummer, who was thirty. <laughs> <laughs> and you're 12 and I'm 12 <laughs> and that was it and from then on I went from working from not working at all to playing three and four nights a week through junior high school high school mm -hmm. this is what I did so the, and then when I went into the studio the guys that played with were also older people were playing with Count Basie's band Lionel Hampton's oh, wow. band Maynard Ferguson's band Duke Ellington's band, the City Symphony Orchestra, the Metropolitan Orchestra, the Philharmonic Orchestra. So you have a combination of all these musicians, the Latin Orchestra, Tito Puente's band, um, Mongol Santa Maria's band, the arrangers, the performers. And we'd all come together to make records at the same time for three hours at a time. Wow, that's <laughs> you know? amazing. And a lot, you know, half the time you didn't know who you were playing with and didn't know what even what the job was. 
But you kind of like Sound Tech Live. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you, you show up, show up and play. You take care of business, right? Exactly. The reason I asked you this is because. I asked I asked Billy Vera this when I had him on the show, and you have a Billy story, I believe, but we're going to get to that in a little bit. I worked bit. with Billy. Yeah, you worked with Billy. Um, but Lemmy and I, I asked I asked this to Billy too, and Lemmy had made this statement: "Goes, I remember before there was rock and roll." Yeah. Do you remember before there was rock and roll? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It was this. It was um, swing music, Dixieland music, you know, big band jazz, Nat King Cole trio, um, Rose Murphy and Slam Stewart. Um, they were novelty acts. They had all kinds of music. Um, straight up and fly right. You know, sick the right. flying monkey. You know, people like Oscar Brown Jr. running around um, telling stories. Um, it was just music. Okay. And when we played together as, as kids, um, when I played with kids or other musicians, we just played music from different cultures, different um, different eras. It was just about the music. How much did that have an effect on your playing? Like um, with, with oh. all that, I mean, with, with all that different, all those different genres and all that, what you had listened to as a kid, I mean, did that, in, well, I, I hate the yeah. influence question, but I mean, did that shape your playing in any way? Oh, no doubt. You know, you know, it's like, the, you know, you plant corn, you get corn, you know. True. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and now I want to eat some corn. Thank you very you much. <laughs> so it's like, um. It's um, it's a combination thing. I had a salad going on. We had a lot of things go- going on um, musically, and it suited me well for going into the studio because mm-hmm. then you have to be um, have have a variety of skill sets and musical backgrounds to be able to make the music new, right? Because they was looking for something new. You don't record to play something old. Mm-hmm. You record to make something new for a new audience or an old song for a new audience. So you know. I got it. I got the challenge in it. You got to be creative. Sometimes everything was written out. You play the ink. But my specialty was making up stuff. So, gotcha. You know? Gotcha. So I was, I was like, if you don't know what you want to do, call Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That is worth a Pat yeah. Fontaine laugh. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times you come into the studio, it'd be a sheet of paper with no title. Mm-hmm. Might be some changes on it. Or it'll be a title with no changes. <laughs> You know, right? <laughs> and nothing written out, and they have a like you know a beat and something about hair, but they start moving and dancing. I might sing a little melody to you, and you say, yeah, I get it. You know, you start you making it up. You know, and all of a sudden you find yourself being an arranger and a composer, and you're not really getting compensated for that. But the joy is just being there. So like, right. it's all right. It's all right. Right. But then it gets to the point where you're saying, enough of this is enough. And by the time I got to be 26 or 27. I was working with Dwayne Allman a lot, and we had a conversation in Muscle Shows. Says we got to stop doing this. This is crazy. This is like a 1969. Uh huh. You know. <laughs> and I said, Dwayne, listen, man, I'm gonna go back home to New York after these sessions. We just got finished doing Wilson Pickett, and we did Hey Jude, Hey Jude album. And I said, I'm just gonna do movies and commercials, jingles and commercials. That's uh-huh. what I'm gonna do. I get these record sessions picking my brain. He says, yeah, that's right, man. I'm going to go home and start a band with my brother. <laughs> <laughs> and that, the Allman Brothers, there you go. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So we, this is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so, I, I guess I, I edit the story because it's a long story. But right, this is where, right. You, know, you go from one to another and eventually gets to the point where you have to do your own thing. Right. No, absolutely. And... Do you remember where you were when you first heard rock and roll? Do you remember what it was? Well, rock and roll per se. Well, okay. When I was twelve, I was it was nineteen fifty eight. Mm-hmm. So you have the history of rock and roll. They were playing on the radio, but it wasn't it wasn't as interesting to me as jazz was. Okay. So I was more listening to jazz, more at least the Mort Figa and Symphony Sid, as opposed to Hal Jackson. Gotcha. <laughs> In New York, okay, right, right. And the other radio stations, mm-hmm. I was aware of them, but I wasn't what I li- what I w- listened to. And um, I was around it all the time playing, you know, I played the traditional band and we play gigs where there'd be like a, a club, so speak, like, so you want to put on a, a dance and you have five or six bands and people would bring their food and their liquor. They, you buy the setup from the, from the, from the dance hall, the, lick, the um, ice bucket and the sodas and drinks. You bring your own booze and your own food. And from six o- nine o'clock until four o'clock in the morning, you partied. And it'd be five or six bands. Mm-hmm. There'd be a Latin band, a Calypso band, 
a jazz band, a rhythm and blues band, a featured vocals band, an everything band, and it'd be a rock and roll band. Okay, so so called rock and roll. So you know, we, I was around it coming up, but I gotcha. never particularly you know, wanted to play the music. Gotcha. And I didn't like the sound of the electric bass particularly. Um, All right. It, 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 it didn't didn't sit well with me because I was playing acoustic bass. Oh, so the stand up. Yeah, nice. that's all I played. But then it got to the kind to the point where. Um, I started playing with younger musicians as opposed to older musicians. They wanted to play like Miles Davis mm-hmm. <laughs> and turned it back on the audience. <laughs> right. <laughs> audience request, you know, they want, they request Stormy Monday and he play, um, um, he play giant steps. You know, he didn't want to do something like that. Something completely different that, that screwed the audience, you know. So I said, this is not working for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? This is not why I'm here. So I said, I'm going to play in that band. So I, I had a gig in Bermuda. That band being the band that had the electric bass in it. Uh-huh. And they were the, mostly the Calypso bands, the rhythm and blues bands. So so now my mindset in terms of the style of music is changing. I'm going to play this kind of music now. And um, I had a gig in Bermuda, Bermuda for Christmas and New Year's. And so I said, come bit, back. A little bit warmer than New York. A lot warmer. <laughs> Even in, especially in December. Right. December. So the summer, the winter, of the, um, the New Year's of 63 going to 64, I got my first electric um, setup. Got me a little suitcase amp and a little Zimgar bass. And I thought I was ready to do it, but it took it took a while to get the instrument. That's a whole other story, getting that together. But eventually I got it together and while I was comfortable playing, I got a sound that I liked. Once mm-hmm. I got a sound that I liked, I said, okay, I can play this. Cool. I want to play it, you know, with the same passion I have for playing the upright. Right. And no matter what music I played, I would put that passion into it. Gotcha. Uh, Billy had told me that he used to do the thing where he was in, like, a band, but they were, like, the backup band every time. And so, like, when name some random star would come to town, they would be the backup band. Yeah, the house did, did, band. Yeah, the house band. Did you, uh, did you go through that, too? Um, not so much. I know um, a friend of mine did, or Reggie Butler. He was Jimmy. But- he was Jimmy Hendrix back 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 up band at the Cafe War. Okay, and they had some interesting experiences. <laughs> Told me some stories how how Jimmy's was music wasn't accepted here. Uh huh. You know, they said, "Man, man, get." Take that stuff back down there to the village. Play for them white folks. We ain't having it up here. <laughs> <laughs> you know? They tried to bring it to Harlem. No, no, no. They ain't going for it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, <laughs> eventually, he had he went to Europe, and they had, uh-huh. they went for it because um, you know you're playing mostly you're playing for people to dance and have a good time and party. Right. They don't want to hear the psychedelic stuff. They want to hear stuff that's going to be like you know on the beat that move the you know get you moving your feet mm-hmm. and it's in the in the groove. You know. So, but Reggie was a Reggie. Reggie was a prolific bass player. So he was hanging with Jimmy, you know, and Jimmy demanded that kind of playing, right? You know, and he eventually got some cast to play with him in Europe, and then came over Billy Cox, and he hit it, you know. So it takes that sometimes. So, your question about was I influenced by rock and roll? Rock and roll is really a combination of rhythm and blues, right? And gospel, country I mean, music, yeah. gospel yeah. music, whatever's going to make you pat your feet actually comes right. into the realms of, you know, that rock. And it's, you know, it was actually rock and roll is actually sex. That's what, yeah. that's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. It's supposed to motivate that. And that's why it was so, it was so against it because now you got these little, you got these white kids dancing to black music and they, you know, the interracial dancing. The stopping all the sexing on the, you know, <laughs> makes sexing legal. Right? <laughs> In that sense. And, you know, you see the Dick Clark shows, you know, you see mm-hmm. everything. The audience was typed a certain way. So it did a lot to bring people together. So I was aware of the power of it. I've always been aware of the power of it. Um, rock to me is music that's going to you know, invigorate people. And besides, right. you know, besides the bedroom, it's also that call for, like, you know, for passion and for justice, you know, and, the, and put in that in that theme. Like, you know, a lot of people love heavy metal because it's a protest, it's a revolution. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's what rap used to be. Right. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, you look at, like, you know, the NWA stuff and the, you know, the public enemy stuff. Yeah. And that that's that was the... Pro- I mean, see, now, the NWA stuff, as a white kid from central Minnesota, to me, it's a comedy record. Because I didn't grow up like that, <laughs> you know? You know, fuck the police and slap the bitch <laughs> like a hoe. It's like... This is hilarious. This yeah, is an Eddie yeah. Murphy record. Because I didn't grow up like that. Right. You know, but you, you get to 
know about it a little bit. It's like, holy shit, this really was a fuck you to everything. Yeah. You know? That was the time. You're coming out of the um, the Vietnam War, all these mm-hmm. things that we went through growing up, you know, as baby boomers um, coming out of that and uh, the, um, the feminine rights, civil, the civil rights movement, all these things converged into the music. So the, the music represented the time. So rock and roll was very valuable in terms of you know, putting the the times um, in the face of the of the American public, in a way that they can engage with it. I got a comment. Uh, Jim Dolesky says backing up Hendrix must have been challenging as hell. Well, you see, I <laughs> it, it, not it wouldn't have been for me, uh, no, right? Because <laughs> you're a guy. <laughs> no, uh-huh. no, I play his music. No, I play his songs. That you know, I, I wish I would have loved to have the opportunity to have played with him. Right. Um, because he plays it's improvisational, mm-hmm. it's um, off the um, it's avant garde, and jazz is about that. So he was bridging the gap between blues, gospel, and rock and roll, and and, and added the electric the electronic element of the screaming right. guitar. Yep, um, which was not done before. Mm-hmm. So he added another element to it, which really hit you know hit home, resonate with a lot of people. Do you think Hendrix was as good as a player as everybody says he is? Oh, he was a great player. He was an, you know, being an when you're the first, you don't have to be the greatest player. You see, true, <laughs> not the true. Player. You know, people yeah. don't realize that. Yeah, you know, you yeah, have, yeah. he was he was him, and he was the first of him. Now there's copies of him who have technically oh, yeah. play his stuff probably more proficiently, but it still doesn't sound like him. It doesn't have the grease. It's too clean. Right, yeah. It doesn't have the cloud. If you see it on YouTube, somebody like, you know, picking faster or yeah. whatever and doing virtuosic right. stuff, it's like that's not breaking any ground. It's see, not breaking any it, ground. But it's just showing that, you know, it can be done and it's right. appreciated. And it's, right. It's, well, and, 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 and that's like, because Ace Frehley is the reason I started playing guitar. But Ace, is he the best player? No, he's not. But he plays with his dick. You know, it's like there's a sl- there's a greasiness about it. And that's the same thing with Hendrix. You know, it's was he technically, was he Eddie Van Halen? No, he wasn't. He was his own entity, you know. And that was a part of his music that was amazing. Certainly. And it goes to show you that you don't have to be, um, I always say like there's, there's so many things that make anything happen. You right. know, like I said, four fingers and a thumb make a fist. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's never just one thing. Right. It's, it's, it's never just one thing. And in fact, that's why I started my nonprofit organization, Solar Energies, which I'm going to take a minute to pitch Please right do. Now. Please do. Yeah. Um, it's about bringing people together, cultural diversity, and bringing elements of people's lives together in a form they can all interact. And what we're pushing now is our, my dream of making music using color sounds. Mm-hmm. Which has been around for since um, Pythagoras three thousand years ago. Temperature. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Three thousand years ago, but we only use the colors of the rainbow when we refer to color sound music. Right. And as a musician, you might you would probably relate to this. And most people, not even being musicians, relate to the fact that on a piano you have white keys and black keys, and the color sound music that Pythagoras represented or delineated from the rainbow only refers to the white keys ironically those are the all the natural keys there's no flats and no sharps so to speak this mm-hmm. is all the white keys um my system uses the five black keys also but in addition to the six, um the um the six white keys you have the five black keys um making it um let me remember my math right it's six twelve it's six tones it's six tones to the scale um then you go up an octave higher. But at any rate, my system incorporates the black keys. So somebody visually looking at a piano says, okay, I'm using all the keys now. Now, as of 2015, the music that was most popular in the world in the Billboard 100 used, only 10% of them used the white keys. 90% of them used the, the black keys oh, also. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So I said, wow, I'm on to something here. Right. You know, the fact that what we're listening to and what you're experiencing it's not what's in the heavens. It's what's here on earth. Right. And so I renamed those black keys and gave them colors. Pythagoras had the white keys as red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, purple. And that's all they have. That's all they have. Okay. That's color, mm-hmm. rainbow colors. So the black keys, I had to make up names for them. So 
I added pink, gold, silver. I love gold. Turquoise and brown. Ah. <laughs> ah. Okay. So now we're looking at the real world that we live in. And we're able to take a picture now. Take a picture of us here and actually cross-reference it, cross-reference it with the music in our library and determine the key of the music that's, and compare that with the key of the music and you can cross-reference a photo with your music and vice versa. Oh, wow. In, a, in the real sense. In the very real sense. So you're not just using rainbow colors. You're using everything. And that black on your shirt, that represents a note that's so dark, so low, it's black. But it'll be in that key. Okay? Gotcha. And if it's, it's making light sense in the now. picture, it's going to be high register. So therefore, we only see like five registers of, of, um, of color. So therefore, I have to consolidate it. But the idea is to make it so that it's visually um, attainable and accessible. The idea is to make it accessible. So this is what we're working on now. Very cool. Developing the software so we can have this on your phone. It can be a learning system. Oh, wow. Yeah, video yeah. Video game. Therapy for somebody who is sitting up have nothing to do in their mind, just wandering, and they see a color blue, and they hear a sound, and, oh, my what song is in the key of blue? They might have a thousand songs in the key of blue, a thousand songs in the key of brown. But if you actually hear it before, you wouldn't even have, have a key of brown. It right. would just be red, you know, and it's not even a true key. It's already, right. you know, C and A minor, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now we have all the 12 keys. And every mode of the 12 keys, so it opens up to a whole realm of expression that you can actually see in the real time in the real world. So this is what we're looking at, keeping the um, organization alive with the software to, um, to um, make us, uh, sustain us financially, basically. Is there, um, is there a website people can donate? Um, how can people help out? Definitely. They can go to Solar Energy. I'll spell it for you. It's S-O-U-L. E R. I Energy. see what you did there. Soul. <laughs> Soul, baby. Soul, baby. Me and you. Hell yeah, baby. <laughs> you know? That's awesome. So is this like a teaching system or is it it's like a, it's, a, it's a teaching system? A visualization. Entertainment, like- therapy, industrial application. You can design your room for, of the color of your favorite song. So it's like a synesthesia. Oh, ah. No, it's not synesthesia. It has nothing to do with your emotions. It's just what you like. You like a particular song. You find out it's in the key of brown. Interesting. Oh, well, what else is in the key of brown? Well, in the key of brown, we have brown. We have red. We have orange. We have gold. We have green. We have blue. We have indigo and back to brown. That would be the key of brown. Key of you know so it's yeah I mean the brown being the one the gold and brown being the black keys that are not present in the on the on the piano it's that B flat and that E flat that make the key of brown just like in the, using all the terms of music the theory hasn't changed it's still the same theory mm-hmm. but now this tank instead of having accidentals we have colors names for the accident notes instead of like B flat A flat G sharp Z flat F flat whatever now it's a color that you can readily see and retrieve. Gotcha. Okay. It's all making sense. And now. cross-reference. And cross-reference. That's the key. Cross-referencing. So once your mind starts to your mind starts to cross-reference one thing, you can cross-reference a lot of other things. You see where you can do this and have. Um, that's why we have color coding. Makes it easy to find things. Okay. <sighs> Same system. I. <laughs> My mind is blown right now. But the idea is to make it usable so that you can actually have something that's going to be relative, that's going to uh, elevate our senses, our uh, thought process, our ability to use our brain, Mm -hmm. you know, to come together and different cultures. Imagine somebody in China that's seeing the same colors. You can compose a song of music based upon colors. Don't spell to speak a word of English. Right. You know, just go with the color. We can use colors. You can come in with the world of the internet. Collaboration is possible. Just bump, pick and using colors as opposed to notes. Fucking brilliant. It's a format. All right. Uh, I have two people saying, please repeat the website. And I'm actually going to type it out. So it's www.soul. Mm-hmm. E-R. Soul or. Okay. And followed by energy. E-N-E-R-G-Y dot org. Dot org. It's a non-profit. 
So your donations Excellent. can be deducted. Excellent. Very, very cool. Um, back to the music stuff. Uh, well, not that we're off no, the music stuff. Um, yeah, tell me the Billy Vera story. You played with played with Billy. Billy's been on and this Ju- show. I know Billy. And Judy Clay. And I, Judy Clay, I, that's I right. Their, um, is it To Love Somebody? What was that big record? Uh, I should know I this. I remember them with the sweet... You know, I can... I see them with the sweet inspirations for some reason locked together. Maybe they did the same material, but um, I worked with Billy Vera and um, Judy Clay. I recorded with them, I think, before I recorded with the Sweet Inspirations. Okay, you played with the Sweet Inspirations? Sure, that was Elvis's. No, that was that's my wife. The ah, sweet Sensations. Sweet Sensations. Sensations. Gotcha. Gotcha. We're gonna get Elvis. to that. We're gonna get she. Oh, she. Oh, oh, yeah. oh. I played with the Sweet Inspirations. That was a reason. Can Franklin's open worms everywhere. <laughs> oh my God! Storybook Children. Wow. Is that yeah. sound right? Storybook Children. Um, doesn't sound familiar. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not, All right. know, but All I remember right. working with them, and it's I forget my. It's I'm not even on my discography. To come to think of, it. I forget about them for some reason. Did you? Do you play live with them, or did you just record with them? Record with them. Okay. Okay. Because yeah. then I saw as then I saw Billy and, and McKell's in, in in the eighties. So I was, this is like in the sixties when I worked with Billy. And yeah, Billy yeah, yeah. In the sixties, and yeah. then I saw him again like in the um had to be late. Um, let me see, late seventies, early eighties up at McKell's. That's the last time I saw him. Oh wow! So yeah, because there's a long gap between the studio and seeing him live and blah blah. Right? So. Yeah, because uh, it was a very interesting story when Billy told that. It's like <clears throat> they were the very first integrated couple to ever play the Apollo. His poster is yeah. still up. Yeah, yeah. That's insane. Yeah, the it's first. unbelievable. Uh, so, uh, tell me, how did you end up working with Aretha? How did you end up working with Wilson Pickett? Um, I know of Wilson Pickett because of the greatest movie of all time, bar none, The Blues Brothers. <laughs> this is how my, Whew. this is how I learned about rhythm and blues and soul music is from The Blues yeah. Brothers. People dedicated to the art, man. They were those cats were dedicated to the art, and you know, and um, Elwood. Um, What's his actor's name? Um, I Aykroyd. See, Dan Aykroyd. Dan. Well, yeah. I did. I worked with. Um, we did a serious radio uh, broadcast when Serious first opened up in New York. Uh huh. And um, he was there. Hubert Sumlin was there. Um, Rob Paparazzi, um, the Blues Brothers musical director. So that's why they were so hooked up. But Dan yeah. Aykroyd, that's who it was. Yeah. They love music. Yeah, they do. Those cats, they yeah, they, they love do. music, and they do anything to keep the, the show express their gratitude, showing where it comes from. Now the cats in England. They're all about that. They'll tell you right away where it comes from. But the Americans uh-huh. over here, everything they want to think, make, make you think they invented so and so and so and so. But the you know Europeans, they really they really hold on to the traditional roots and show gratitude towards the founders of the music. So Dan Aykroyd is one of those people. Mm-hmm. Okay, and him and his partner um, Jack John Belushi. Yeah, um, they love music. So they brought it all to the table. I mean, they brought Ray in. They brought Cab Calloway in. Yeah. I mean, how cool is that? James Brown. James Brown. Aretha. Aretha you know. Yeah. <laughs> think. <laughs> you think. <laughs> you know. Think about. It. <laughs> think. 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 Well, I can that, do the whole dance, but I well, won't. <laughs> now that one was that song there was the first record I recorded with Aretha. Really? Think. I. I'm on the original recording of that. Oh wow! And how I got there was, um, make a long story short. Um, I was working with King Curtis mm-hmm. and he recorded Memphis Soul Stew and he promised me when I joined the band that I was going to make his records because I was already making records I recorded with Nina Simone mm-hmm. um, J.J. Jackson all prior to meeting King Curtis so I'm saying like okay well okay I'm going to do this job but you didn't give me record more recording sessions I'm down so we're doing a couple of months, and um, I'm recording with other people in the band, Melvin Lasty, the pastor, the trumpet player, the guitar player, um, the group Satan and Adam. There's a blues duo, Satan and Adam. Well, that's another story. It goes developed from there. But um, he was in the band. And next thing I know, there's a record coming out called Memphis Soul Stew, and I'm not on it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the well, music business. Yeah. <laughs> I left the band immediately. Well, right, as well you should. <laughs> right? I joined Lionel Hampton's band. And I did a month with him. And he was supposed to go to Japan. That didn't happen. So here I am in New York. I'm saying, you know, this road thing ain't happening. Because mm-hmm. once you leave your seat in the studio, forever in their minds, they think you're on the road. They won't call you. 
So you're sitting home or between gigs on the road and they think you're out of town. So the thing is, you got to sneak out of town or just be, you know, you know, it's like you just can't do that anymore. Right. So I said, I'm not going out of town anymore. I'm going to stay here and just make records. I get a call from Ken Kurz. He says, well, OK, you don't got to you don't got to play in the band anymore, but you, you I want you to make all the records. <laughs> 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 so. You can stay in New York, you know, you, I'll make all my records and blah, blah, blah. So he started turning me on to other acts mm-hmm. at Atlantic Records. Okay. So there I thought I'm doing Aretha Franklin, I'm doing Wilson Pickett, I'm doing Les McCann and Eddie Harris and all the other number of um, Margie Joseph. Um, I think, is that where I met Billy? Was he an Atlantic artist? I believe he was. Yes, that yeah, was. Well, that's probably where it was along that along that run. You know, the, the truth was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, sometimes you have to dig to get the truth, <laughs> but, <you> know, <laughs> right? <laughs> but if that's all you tell, then it's like, you know you don't have to make up have to make up anything, you know. But things happen because I forget a lot of stuff, you know. Right. I forgot Will and Metberry, but that's probably that's probably where. And so they had me come down to the session just to observe the session mm-hmm. um, with Aretha. They had the band from Muscle Shoals: Tommy Cogbill, Roger Hawkins, Jimmy Johnson, Spooner Odom. And Jerry said, Jerry Wilson said, come in down this observe the session. So I bought my bass and I'm sitting there and they're playing a song. Started, the session was from 10 to 1, then 2 to 5. And the 10 to 1 is going really bad. They ain't making no progress on this one song. They stuck. And immediately from my first heart, I started Aretha singing it and playing it. I said, oh, really? And they're doing that with it? <laughs> so I sat there and suffered for about. Right. Three hours while they, you know, trying to do with this and do that and do this and do that with it. And finally, Jerry and Alexa said, Jerry, you know, go in there and see what you can do. And three takes over. Three takes, it was over. That was Think. That is amazing. Now, they what they were trying to do, they were trying to make it into a rhythm and blues song. Okay. Okay. And these cats from Alabama and Memphis, Tennessee, they were still up in New York. They were trying to make this, but she was playing into rhythm and blues. And I heard it's country right away. Uh-huh. I said, well, just, it's a country song. What are they doing? Play country and get over, get over it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. It's still a blues, you know. Right, exactly. <laughs> country. Is, I got the, uh, so they just, they missed it. So, um, and Tommy started playing the guitar. That's why you hear the guitar, that bluegrass rolling. Yeah, yeah. That makes the whole record for me. He's actually a bebop guitar player. Tommy called Bill, great bassist, but he actually came from playing the guitar, jazz guitar player. So he's playing these flowing b- bluegrass b- bebop lines while I'm playing this country bass line, and she's singing a song and playing the piano. And just like three takes, it was done. Wow, just like that. So that's what you hear in the Blues Brothers record. They tried to copy that. Tried to copy it. They, well, they, well, they, they did a great yeah. job. They did yeah. a great job. Did, did they use? Did, I mean, did they use the Blues Brothers band to record that? Then they used. They, no, they used the blues. They used um, um, Steve Cropper. And Duck Dunn, Duck Dunn, rest his soul. Jackson, the, the Memphis Alan, Alan, Alan Rubin, Lou Marini. Yeah, I knew all those cats. I knew Alan Rubin from a kid. He was Newport Youth Band. He's he he's passed, right? Oh, no. I think I think Mr. Fabulous oh, has, has passed. Mm. I think because I have a goal on this show is I want to interview every living member of the Blues Brothers mm. Band. Well, and I th- I well obviously you know excuse me John's gone, um, Duck is gone. And I think Mr. Fa- I gotta find this out for sure. Yeah, I- check, take it to make it, take a check right. um check it out. Take a second. Alan Rubin. Well, I'll tell you the story about Alan Rubin while you're doing that. Um, yeah, please. He do. was in the Newport Youth Band, and they recorded. These were kids like 15, 16, 14, um, the cream of the crop, and they performed at the Newport Jazz Festival. They were put together for this purpose, and the bass player was Eddie Gomez, and we had been. He was my only competition coming up as a kid. So um, I would listen to that record. Alan, um, Alan played a solo on You Don't Know Nothing About, no. Until you, know, you don't know, um, until you know the meaning of the blues. You know nothing about love until you know the meaning of the blues. I think it's in that and uh, I think Pennies from Heaven. There are a lot of standards, but he played, he was 16 at the time and I was like mm-hmm. 12. And they had already recorded oh, already, wow. okay? So I was like aware of who they were. Um, crazy solo. I mean, to be so young and be so passionate and so right. secure about a ballad playing. Right. Check it out. It's a Newport Youth Band album. He's playing, it's, I forget, it's either, um, the title is eluding me. 
until you know the meaning of the blues is like the last tag of the chorus of the verse. Bum, bum, bum. You don't know what love is. Okay. That's the song. You don't know what love is until you know the meaning of the blues. You don't know what love is until you bum, bum, bum. That's the melody. He tore it up. <laughs> June 8th, 2011. Hmm? June 8th, 2011. Oh, man. That long ago. Yeah. Where have I been? That's another story. Yeah, that's another story. And that's another story. <laughs> <For> another day. <laughs> wow. Well, he was a tremendous musician. Yeah, um, he was. He really was. And always a great cat. We came together in the studio because he was doing sessions. When I came to the studio, he was in the studio doing sessions also. I was like, hey, I know you. You know, it's cool. Uh, and it's just amazing because the, the, the list that I put up on the Facebook page when I started promoting this is like, this is all before 1975 that you recorded with all these people and did the Grammys come after or were the Grammys from During that, that time the Grammys come from um, King Curtis okay first album I did with him finally oh, wow. <laughs> Games People Play uh-huh. uh huh and I got a, um, the um, a Grammy the next year for um, The Thrillers Gone with B.B. King oh wow those are my <laughs> <laughs> and but before that I was nominated with Irma Franklin for doing A Piece of My Heart oh wow that was the first Grammy. That was the first nomination. Um, Do you have them displayed prominently? Or are you on these? Ah, it's like a paperweight. Or it's, 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 they, what they give you now is recognition for the fact that you were a musician on the dates, which is great now uh -huh. um, in this modern era. Before back then, it was like, you know, I got the Grammy. And what, what you do? That's all you do. No, you don't get it. But now they give it to the musicians, the engineers, the the, mm -hmm. the the carpenters, whoever has something to do with the production of the of the. Um, the um, um, music they give a, um, a Grammy to nowadays. So that's how I got it. When it was in like um, from 69 and 70. And I didn't get it to 2014. <laughs> <laughs> that is also worth a yeah, 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 yeah. Pat Fontaine laugh. Um, we got like 10 minutes left because I know you have to, you got to get going here pretty quick. Um, your wife working with Elvis. Tell me about this because. I mean, look at my leg. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, working with your uncle. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had those bloodlines. <laughs> um, she did five years with him, and um, they did Las Vegas. Oh, okay. When you, sit, when you sat at Las Vegas for five years, yeah, and just yeah. stayed there for five years, she was a sweet sensation then. Oh, my God. And she has some stories to tell you. Did you, did, did you know her at this time? I didn't know her at this uh, time. So you never got... Did you ever meet Elvis? No, I never met Elvis. But living in Mississippi, I met a lot of his friends. Oh, I can imagine. A lot of his fans. You know? <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> you know? I can they imagine. All, they, Elvis crazy. And though most of the Grammy winners, ironically, come from Mississippi. Really? Yes, look it up. Natural fact, most of the Grammy winners come from Mississippi. I did not know that. Yeah, it's deep, that man. That is wild and wacky it's, stuff. It's deep down there, man. The Delta, up north in the region, mostly up there, all over. I'm not going to limit it to the Delta, Clarksburg, right. Clarks, um, 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 Clarksville and um, Greenville, Green Lawn. There's a bunch of little cities up there. Um, place where um, BB was born. I forget the name of that city. Um, shouldn't know that one. It was just up there. But anyway, um, loaded with talent. I mean, everybody has a guitar. Right. Even the dogs play guitar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I love that drop. I can't stop. 